two weeks ago we were near this passage and we were looking at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, last week we had Brother Chris Miller actually preached about being still. Well, it was a good message, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so a little bit of a gap. And uh, it's tough sometimes to preach in a series and have it broken up by mm -hmm. other things that, that come up. But that's the way it goes sometimes. And it's a good message that we had this past Sunday evening. We're going to look at beginning in verse 11. Leave the material in the middle portion, of course, is a commentary material. It's, it's in between. We're going to see again the Son of Man in heaven. So beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in, white, in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and of the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Verse 21 of chapter 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Father, I pray that you would give us understanding, give us simplicity as we look at your word. Help us not to focus on the things which are not written, the things which cannot be understood, but help us to look at the things which are written, and the things which you desire for us to know. We pray that you'd help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Bella, would you like to sit with Mrs. Price? Would you like to sit on the, on the seat? Okay. One or the other. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, here we are in the last chapter. Or not the last chapter, but in the last chapter, really, of evil man and his rebellion against God. A few weeks back, we saw the individuals, the armies of the earth, really coming out to meet the Lord. We saw the Lord Jesus calling His 144,000 and bringing them to a place of protection. We saw that valley of Megiddo. And here we see a real description of the events as they're going to take place. We saw that, we, uh, that it's time for the wrath of God to reap the... Or, I'm sorry, for the winepress of the wrath of God to reap literally the wicked, to we reap the sins of the wicked. The imagery here is one that I can only imagine, but I cannot imagine it being painted. It's, it's too much, it's too real, it's too, too grotesque. Literally, the idea that the kings of the earth, the rich, and the captains, and the mighty men, and the bond, and the free, are going to come out against the Lord of hosts. And he literally is going to speak with his mouth their destruction. 
one of the themes that we've seen as we've studied through Revelation is the common theme of the rebellion of man. And my friend, in any manifestation, rebellion is insanity. In any manifestation, rebellion is insanity because rebellion is always against authority. Where does authority come from? God. So who is authority? God. So what is rebellion then? God. Rebellion is, is always, always, always against God. The Bible says for children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. When children rebel against their parents, they disobey their parents, who are they rebelling against? God. The Bible says, uh, wives, obey your husbands, submit yourselves unto them. When a wife rebels against her husband, who is she rebelling against? God. The Bible says to husbands, likewise ye husbands. When it says likewise, it's talking about submitting. That's the context. When a husband rebels against his wife and his duties to his wife, who is he rebelling against? God. When a servant rebels against its ma his master, who is he rebelling against? God. When a master doesn't do right by his servant, whom is he rebelling against? God. All rebellion is against God. And so, when I look at the circumstances where literally John said, I saw heaven open, and I want to remind you that it's no mystery what's been happening on earth. You know, you ever meet somebody and they find out you're a Christian and then they want to talk prophecy with you? It happens to me on airplanes. I almost dread airplane rides because of the silly prophecy questions that are going to happen. There's always something in the headlines, right? Like every day there are, there are newspapers print stories, and every day they print stories about things that are happening. And the things that are happening are always events of the day. And so there's a, there are always, Jesus said when the disciples asked him when the things are going to be, when are these things going to be, what are the signs are going to, that are of his coming, he said when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled for the end is not yet. In other words, there have always been wars and rumors of wars. Uh, I remember being young and really growing. I, my, the people that would have been um, 18 30, to 30 years old uh, when I was born, had, a lot of them had been involved with Vietnam or the aftermath of Vietnam. And uh, I remember growing up, and we were in the Cold Wars, you know, remember the 1980s, late 70s, 1980s, Cold Wars with Russia. And there was a lot of war and rumor of war, but more rumor of war than there was actual war. Until the Gulf War in Iraq, there wasn't an official action while I was growing up, not anything major. And uh, I remember thinking, you know, boy, I'm really glad. You know, I'm not, I'd, I'd hear stories from the guys that were in Vietnam and uh, in the Korean War and World War II, and I'd hear stories about the draft, men being conscripted into service, and they talked about how terrible that was. And I remember being afraid, thinking, man, I don't know if I want to, you know, get caught up in a war where people do such terrible, grotesque things. But the reality of it is, is that there were, even though there weren't any major actions at that time, really since the 1990s, man, it's been, uh, the, the, the Islamists have been keeping the world in continual state of uproar, uproar, uprising, and there's been war. But you know, that's nothing new. No, there never has been new. There has always been war, rumors of war. So when I ride on an airplane or something like that, I'll sit down next to someone, and I always want to witness to people. I always want to, you know, have a chance to uh, give them a tract or tell them how easy it is to be born again. And that's what I like to do. Matter of fact, I'd like for people to know me as a Christian and not as a pastor. Pastor is a title. It's an office for our church. And actually, it's kind of my job. Now, I don't see it as a job. It's a calling. It's a special calling to me. But it isn't anything special about me as a person. You understand what I'm saying by that? In other words, the Bible says, uh, Paul told Timothy, he said, I would that men of God should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so all men ought to be men of God. Sometimes they call the pastor the man of God. Well, that ought to be an accurate description, but it also ought to be an accurate description for any man who knows God. In other words, we're all men of God. And so, uh, I kind of don't like people to know I'm a pastor. When I visit churches and I'm on vacation, I like to slip into the back row and just go to church, you know, just worship, be preached to, and just hear and receive and, and uh, then leave before anyone finds out I'm a pastor. I don't really like people to know that because I'm a person. You know, and, and uh, you know, so... I don't really like the whole, well, as a pastor, what do you think? So, uh, you'll never get anything serious from me 
in my official office of pastor unless it's as pastor of our church. When people say as a pastor, then they're going to throw something on your, you know, expect it, some, something subhuman or supernormal from you. What's supernormal mean? I just made up that word. Integrated word? You like that one? Yes. Yes. What do you think it means? It means like it's completely normal. Good job. There you go, kid. All right. Completely normal. That's me. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, my point is this. Whenever someone finds out that you're a pastor, they always say, well, what do you make of everything that's been happening? You can ask that question any day you want to on an airplane of a pastor and expect that they would say, well, we're living in the last days. Friend, newsflash, we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. It's been the last days. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> yes, you know, I, I always want to say, well... We're living in the last days. I just want to. I don't have a deep voice. I never was blessed. I got. I'm a tenor. Otherwise, I would do it. You know, we're living in the last days. It just isn't. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't have the. You know, Charlie, say it for me. We're living in the last days. No, I want to to base. Charles, Char can you do it? Can you do it? We're in the last days. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. None of y'all can live in the last well, days. Can say that? Sophia can do it better than you guys. <laughs> We're living in the last days. <laughs> anyway, I don't have it. But I want to say that as a joke, but the reality is that people are really seriously asking, what does it mean? I want to tell them about the gospel. I don't want to tell them about headlines and so forth. People always want to know what something means, what the significance of it is. You know, we think about things in terms of what we're seeing, what's described in the Scripture of this evening. We think of it in terms of a major cataclysmic event, and it is. I mean, Jesus is going as a righteous judge in a capacity that the world has never seen Jesus in. The world began seeing Jesus as Creator God. The world has seen Jesus as the Passover Lamb. In other words, He is the Lamb that would be offered. The world has seen Jesus as the Son of God, as, you know, the King of the Jews who didn't set up His throne. But the world has never seen Jesus in this capacity before. But now I want to remind you about something. Jesus is in heaven, and heaven's open. These events that have happened, the taking up of the church, the sealed judgments, these are not events that are in isolation and people are saying, well, I wonder what's happening. And everybody reads into it and says, well, you know, I read in Revelation that there's an angel that blew a trumpet, and then this is the sort of thing that happened. And so this might be it. No, it's literally, you can see the hand of God judging men. You literally can see God's hand judging. And so it isn't as though there's a mystery about where judgment is coming from. And in our minds, that makes the rebellion of men all the much more unreasonable. But isn't rebellion always unreasonable? It is. I've seen two-year-olds in rebellion. And I don't really think that a two-year-old little boy that tries to kick his daddy is going to get very far with it. But I've seen it doesn't make very much sense to me, but I've seen it. I've seen teenagers, little punk teenagers, telling their parents how it's going to be. I mean, I've, just seen, I've seen 13 year olds, you know, giving their, you know, their, uh, their independent speech. Not, you can ask a question afterward, okay? But thank you for paying good attention. I've seen little kids talk about, you know, this is the way things are going to be and laying down the law with their parents. And I guess some parents believe them, but mine wouldn't have, you know? So I've, I've seen it. It doesn't matter what scale it is. Rebellion, my friend, is always against God, and rebellion is always unreasonable. There's never been a winning rebel. There's never been a rebel that God has said, well, now I see your point, I concede. No, a rebellion is always going against the flow. He's always, always, always going against the truth, He's never right, and he is always going against God, and you never win against God. And so when we see this event where literally the armies of the nations of the earth who are so frustrated because their Babylon has been destroyed, and, the, and they're, so, they're so angry against God. And by the way, what's God's crime here? What are they angry about? Why 
Well, yeah, some of them have judged. They blasphemed God when, when they've had some of the judgments. That's true. But what is God's crime? And the answer is simple. It's not a trick question. There is no crime. God hasn't done anything. See, the issue is they will not bow. They will not bow. And I would exhort every person, learn to bow. Learn to bow. You know it's so helpful for us to worship God because worship does involve bowing. Just the practice of worship is good for us. You know, it's not in our nature, not in any of us, to just bow, to just submit to authority. We have a rebel in all of us. And so... It's good practice for us to worship God because the very concept, the very understanding of worship is bowing. It's literally going before God and saying, everything that you are, I am not. Everything that I ought to be, you are. And God, you are more, I am less in every way. And that puts us in our rightful place and really helps us with this matter of rebellion. It's amazing, isn't it? You've determined that you're going to submit yourself to God's authority, and it's amazing when you run into authority how sometimes, you know, we use the old, it isn't what he said. Don't you love that phrase? It's kind of a new one, I think, isn't it? Like the last 10 years. It isn't what he said, it's how he said it. Well, it really doesn't matter how they say it. I'm not sure there's a right way to say something you don't like. Right? Eat broccoli. Well, actually, some of you all like broccoli. Uh, you know, whatever it is, it isn't what he said. No, actually, it is what he said. That's one of the most disingenuous statements there ever was. It absolutely is what he said. You did not like what he said, and so you tried to make something out of his manner. And the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of people have a problem with God's manner, don't they? I don't know how many people have told me that it is wrong for God to require only Jesus for salvation. Well, it's okay for Jesus to die for us, but to make that the only way. I don't know how many people have told me something like that. Well, I don't mind worshiping God, but I'm not going to go through Jesus. In other words, it isn't what He said, it's how He said it. My friend, God is God, and God's way is the only way. There's no way that God could pacify the variety of rebels. Because the rebellion isn't the issue. Mark it down, understand this, comprehend it. A rebel never asks why in order to understand a rebel never says, why? Because it's just like, I have to confess before everyone that I do not possess the intellectual capacity to comprehend what's going on, so if you could dumb it down just a little bit, that way I could happily submit with understanding. Does a rebel ever ask why in that kind of a manner? No. It's okay to ask why. You know, I've heard people say you should never question God. Well, um, you should never accuse God. But it's intelligent to question God. It kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. God, what are you doing in my life? Very good. Then, how do you want me to respond? Okay. And you know, it's a real help. Sure. It's a real help to you. So here we are in this passage of Scripture, and we see the same thing, and it's magnified. I mean, it's more apparent. It's more ridiculous. Rebellion is more ridiculous at this stage than it ever has been before because of where God is coming from and where they're coming from. I love the um, little ironic statement Solomon made in Ecclesiastes 5 when he said, God is in heaven and now upon earth. The comparison and location really kind of separates us. Jesus said the same sort of thing in John 3, remember? No man hath ascended into heaven, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. In other words, just the place where God comes from separates who He is and who we are. You've never been to heaven, but Jesus came from there. Who's greater? Jesus. Jesus is. That's exactly right. And so that's the idea here. Just the, just the description here. So look at verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and true. By the way, I love the names, the descriptions, the adjectives that describe God, the Son here. The Bible says, And in righteousness He doth judge and make war. Jesus is not herein picking a petty argument with small men. Jesus here is executing righteousness and judgment. In our Wednesday night series in Isaiah, one of the things that we're seeing is God's accusation against 
Judah is that what God wanted was righteousness and what else? Judgment. And he got the opposites of those two things. And here we find that Jesus is coming in righteousness. In other words, he's right to judge. The Bible says, in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. Pastor, what in the world does that phrase mean? Nobody knows. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. Uh, nobody knows the name that the Lord Jesus had written. But the very idea here is this is a very similar statement. Remember when Jesus said uh, about his second coming, that of that day and that hour, or I mean, I'm sorry, of his coming to take us up? He said, of that day and that hour knoweth no man, not even the Son and man. But who knows? God does. And this would be a reverse statement where there's a name written on the Son that no one knows. And it seems from the text, not even the Father knows. In other words, this is the very distinct person of the Son of God. So distinct in His person. By the way, it's a great, great verse if you're studying the doctrine of the Godhead the three persons of God, to see that Jesus is God, but He is a very distinct person as God. And this is a very distinct name that no man knows. I'm not going to say that God doesn't know the name, but it's a name that applies only to Jesus. He's called in the context faithful. He's called in the context true. He's called. Uh, uh, his, he's labeled on His, on his uh, vesture, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His name is called the Word of God. But there's a name that's written that no man knows. It's really absurd and somewhat comical to me that books are written about verses like this. Isn't it? Sometimes the Bible doesn't say what something is. And, and uh, you know, I've sat in seminary classes before when the possibilities are laid out. Well, so-and-so, you know, wrote an article and his view is this. And then this guy wrote an article and his view is this. This guy wrote an article, and his view is this. And uh, the really answer to, to a question like this, what name was written? Nobody knows. That's what the Bible says. Maybe okay. that's the name. What's that? Maybe that's the name. Nobody knows. Yeah, maybe, maybe nobody knows is written there. I don't think Jesus is playing jokes here. That would be a funny one, but it's not a joke. It's something that has to do with his righteous and his holy character, something that represents him distinctively as God. See, Bella, sometimes... Uh, people will attack the person of Jesus and they'll say that He isn't actually God. But this is a verse of the Bible that actually shows that Jesus has a name that really is above all names. So we don't know what that name is, but it separates Him apart from any kind of a man and so He has to be God. And so, that's our point. So, maybe the name says, nobody knows. Don't think that's probably it because then you'd know it. And then it wouldn't be it anymore, would it? So, okay. So now the Bible says on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Whose blood, whose blood is Jesus' vesture dipped in? His. His own blood. His own blood. Why is Jesus right to judge the wicked? Because he died for them. He shed his blood for them so that they could be made righteous. My friend, the blood of Jesus blood of Jesus is such a testimony, such a witness. It's a witness to God in heaven every time we go there to pray that the throne room of heaven is the place where the blood of Jesus has been brought to satisfy our sin debt. It's amazing when I have the audacity to pray that I recognize that the blood of Jesus is there as a witness that I have the right to pray. And here we see that the blood of Jesus is on on Jesus. His garment is dipped in blood and it's a reminder that He has the right to judge. That's terrible, isn't it? Isn't that a horrible truth? That Jesus has the right to... that God has the right to save us because of the sacrifice of Jesus. But yet Jesus has to judge because of individuals that refuse His blood which is shed for them. And now their blood's going to be shed on their own behalf because they would not take, not receive the shed blood of Jesus Christ for them. The Bible says in verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. This is a pretty easy 
pretty easy assignment to go into battle. You ever read the Red Badge of Courage as, as a kid? I'm not, I'm not endorsing the book or whatever. But, uh, you know, it's a young man that wonders whether he has the courage to go into battle. And, and uh, turns out anybody has the courage to die is kind of, the, you know, the theme of the book actually he cuts and runs and then ends up, yes. Anyway, I don't even know if it's a good book. It maybe, it's, maybe it's terrible. I don't know. But uh, I've read it a few times. It's been quite a while. It didn't make a good enough impression on me to read it over and over again, like some books. But uh, the point of, of what I'm saying here, I don't know what the point of that was. I had some kind of a point that I was making with it, but I got off. Fleming threw me off. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, I was saying that, the, that the, the battle assignment isn't one that we'll need any courage for. I mean, I could follow Jesus. There's a pretty good application there, isn't there? Isn't there? I mean, ultimately, the war that we're waging is against evil, it's against sin, but the power that we're, that we're waging it in is not our strength. I love what Jesus said to His disciples when He told them, Come unto Me, ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, Take My yoke upon Me and learn of Me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I will confess, I will acknowledge to any person that the burden that they bear is too much. Sometimes people tell me about their lives and the loads and the things that they're going through and they say it's too much and I have to say it is for you. It's too much for you, but it isn't too much for Jesus. I have heard so many Christians talk about the life that God's called them to live, and sometimes they say it's too much to live for Jesus. No, my friend, it's light. It's easy. The problem is you're trying to bear your burden in God's as though somehow in your works of righteousness you've got to earn something or get something that God gives you grace for. And here we see this army which is following the Lord Jesus, and they're there for the testimony, they're there for the witness, but they're not there to do battle. They're just an army. They're following Him. Look what happens. The Bible says... Verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule it with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. My friend, when Jesus speaks, the rebels are destroyed. In the same way that God spoke into existence the world, Jesus Christ is going to speak the destruction of every rebel under the sun. He's going to say the word. Is that a contest? No. It's no contest. It's done. It's finished. At the word of Jesus. And the armies that follow him, I just cannot imagine as they're there riding with him, as they're following after him, I just can't imagine the awe with which they're struck. That anyone would dare to rebel against God. That anyone would come out to meet God. Friend, it's the exact opposite of common sense. Heaven's open. Jesus is coming to judge the wicked. And they come toward Him. They come at Him. Instead of bowing, or instead of fleeing. And the battle is over at the word. Literally, he speaks their destruction with the sword of his mouth. If you're here this evening and you have never bowed to God, you ought to consider the odds. You ought to be honest and say, what chance do I have? Where is my rebel rebellion going to take me? What will it get me? And friend, I mean, you're not going to strike a blow. You're not going to even damage or make anything more than just a rush to your own destruction. You'd better bow. And as we look at the lost... Do you realize, do you understand that every person who has not yet bowed at the cross of Jesus Christ is in the same precarious position? Thank God, man.
times I've been on the, at a person's deathbed where they've made a choice to bow. I remember the first time, I think, in my life, maybe, I, maybe it's not so, but the first time I personally witnessed somebody get saved was a man who was a, was a Jewish man, and he was dying of cancer in his 80s in my hometown. And I was actually in college at the time and went to witness to him a few times, and actually one time he prayed to trust Jesus as his Savior. And I mean, he literally died within days of that. I know of a lot more instances of individuals where it just seems as though they've waited just and waited and waited and waited until it's almost too late, and yet they've bowed to the Lord Jesus. But any person who has not yet bowed is exactly like the one who plans on meeting God. Sometimes it sounds pretty good the way they phrase the rebellion, doesn't it? Well, I'm going to wait until I die. And then, you know, I think God knows me. He knows the person that I really am. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to take my chances with God. In other words, I won't bow. And the words maybe sound passive. The words maybe sound reasonable, but they're every bit as rebellious as a person that comes out to do war with the Son of God. And it's a serious matter, this matter of bowing to God, this matter of rebellion. The Bible says in verse 16, He hath on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is it that's coming to meet Him? The kings of the earth, the men that would call themselves lords. Whose king is Jesus? He's their king. Now I'll remind you of a truth that ought to sink in for us. God is the God of all living, whether they bow to Him, whether they acknowledge Him or not. It may help if you're talking to someone who is considering whether they ought to receive Jesus and they're not willing to think about or listen, you know, when they make statements about God, to remind them that God is your God. Oh, He's your God. You haven't bowed to Him, but He is your God. Jesus is your King. Jesus is your Lord, whether you bow or not. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And here we see, I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. And literally they're being called to eat the flesh of the kings and the lords, the captains, the mighty men, the, the horses, all of them that sit on them. And this is just amazing to me that just the scope of God's ability and power. Literally, an angel standing in the sun tells the birds, clean it up. And they do. Isn't that something? The men that are left on earth in rebellion come to meet the Lord Jesus. He speaks their destruction. And an angel says to the birds, clean it up. The Bible says, after this, Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So after this, we see the, the beast. Verse 20, the false prophet. With, the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that brought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And here it is, literally, God picks them out. The beast, the one that we saw that was affiliated with Babylon, the great whore. We see the false prophet picked out. These two individuals are picked out. Alive, the Bible says. Everybody else, all the men that follow them are destroyed, and they're cast alive into the lake of fire. And here, my friend, is a reminder that the lake of fire is not a joke. Hell is separate from the lake of fire. This is a new place of torment. It's eternal torment. Pretty soon we're going to see in the next couple of weeks hell being cast in the lake of fire, death and hell. But at this moment we see these individuals that have impressed the whole earth to follow them. They've impressed the whole earth to rebel against God and to come after them. And we see God takes them puts them in the lake of fire. There's a... Uh, I don't know. I don't think Tony drew it, but Tony had a t-shirt one time that had... Uh, was kind of making fun of the uh, God picking people to go to heaven, picking people to go to hell. 
and just had basically two big fingers, you know, pulling somebody up and like stick figures or whatever. You'd have to see, and it was pretty humorous if you if you uh, like to make theological jokes. But uh, you know, it's got just a little finger of a person. God's selecting this person. And God's pulling this person. Everybody's walking, I think, on the way to the brink of destruction, and here's God selecting some, you know, hand picking them. Well, that really is only a joke. But the reality of it, my friend, is that God is literally going to take the most powerful beings on earth who have elevated themselves and thought so much of themselves, and God's just going to take them and put them in the lake of fire. You know, Michael and the archangels said they didn't, they didn't rail against the devil. And uh, I am frightened to death out of giving place to the devil myself. I don't know if you are or not, but... People like to ask questions about devils and demons and that sort of thing. And to be quite honest with you, I've learned that, that that's not something you play with. There are some individuals that are fascinated with that. Generally speaking, the charismatics just love to tamper with demons. They schedule meetings so they can get together and, and play with devils. And it's not, a, it's not a light thing because, my friend, we're lower than the angels. We as men are. And so... Uh, we are covered by the blood of Jesus, and we're protected by the blood of Jesus. But it's not a light thing to mess with the devil. But I'm amazed at the matchup here, aren't you? I mean, the beast is so powerful. He's impressed everybody in the earth and the world. False prophets impress so many people. They think literally he can't die. And God takes him and puts him in hell, or in the lake of fire, I meant to say. Won't answer questions till afterward, okay? But it's good that you've got questions. Oh. Well, I won't take comments until afterward either. Not a comment. I know. But it's just too bad. This life's really, really difficult right now. And fortunately, it's the way it is. So let's close, shall we? Let's finish up. The Bible says in verse 21, The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Is anyone going to escape God's wrath? Mm, no. no. Including me? No. Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because the fact of the matter is, is that God judged His Son in my place. I never escaped anything. I never got away with anything. Jesus took my place. And my friend, I cannot illustrate, I cannot describe how illogical and unreasonable it is to have the work of the cross offered on your behalf and to literally bow up, and to shake your fist at God, and to challenge God. Go out to meet Him. There are a lot of people that die every day. And it's not the same events, but it's the same rebellion. And we as believers ought to be burdened, we ought to be fearful, we also ought to understand rebellion for what it is. You ever met such a nice person that it almost seemed like they didn't need to be saved? I've met believers who say foolish things. And one foolish thing I've heard of from a couple of people I can think of is, you know, they're, they're, they're a better Christian than most Christians. No. They think that their righteousness is better than the blood of Jesus. And my friend, that is the most outlandish, outrageous display of rebellion possible. Mm -hmm. And you and I need to look at it for what it is. We need to see it for what it is. And when we see it, the manifestations of the same in ourselves, we need to recognize the association. And I just want to tell you something. I don't want anything to do with that. Do you? Listen, I'll be there with the armies following the Lord Jesus. But I don't want anything to do with that. I mean, we could we have terms in our vernacular that would try to describe it, but they really don't describe the insanity of rebellion. But rebellion, my friend, is the ultimate insanity. And it's manifested in our day through unbelief, refusing to receive the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. You and I ought to have compassion on the lost. We ought to preach the gospel as compassionately, as clearly, and as as in, with as much of an imploring and a beseeching and a begging of people to bow to the Lord Jesus. But we should not misunderstand rebellion. 
It's not a nice person who's just so good that they can't see Jesus. It's a person who thinks so much of themselves that they think nothing of God. Rebellion will blind you. Rebellion will take you to an unreasonable, outrageous place where literally you'll be doing things like these individuals. It's crazy, isn't it? And I don't want any part of it. So what do we do as believers? Preach the gospel. See rebellion for what it is when it's in ourselves, when it's in those around us. My friend, in the place of rebellion, bow at the cross of Jesus. Father, thank You for the Word. Thank You for Your message. And I just pray that You would help us to be very, very clear about what rebellion actually is. Help us to understand in our minds with great simplicity that anything that is disguised in any way as contrary to Your will is rebellion. And I pray that You would help us to believe and to bow as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. You can ask questions.